of hunting adventure is a lot like walking through the pages of National Geographic magazine, but with a shotgun and waders. Uh, it's, very, it's very culturally immersive. Like on the drive up, we're going through this little remote mountain village and right in the quote downtown of this little dirt road village, there's a family skinning dinner, skinning a llama. And uh, we stopped, we visited with them. Mississippi. Estados Unidos. It's almost not just a place, it's a time. You know, so many of these off the beaten path trips are like stepping back in time. And Peru is certainly like that. It's certainly like stepping back in time. It's got a very, very rich and varied cultural history that for the last couple of centuries really hasn't changed too much. Just imagine being at 16,000 foot. It's a large plateau. In fact, it's the second largest in the world, uh, exceeded only by Tibet. And still you've got these mountains towering all around you. And because of it gets a lot of precipitation in this plateau, there's a lot of big lakes that attract uh, highly niche specific waterfowl species that you'll not find anywhere else in the world. You come to Peru to hunt waterfowl but to also kind of immerse yourself in this really unique culture. From way up in the Andes Mountains at 16,000 foot down to the Pacific Ocean, we're targeting waterfowl species that are very niche oriented. So we really get to see a big variety of uh, country and species. It, it's such an amazing adventure to get up in the Andes. Think about this, the uh, water runs downhill and collects in, in low-lying wetlands. That's where we all hunt ducks mostly. And so it's always very interesting that we're climbing up into the Andes Mountains on this little single trail all the way up to 16, 17,000 feet to chase waterfowl. For those who don't like heights, and I don't like heights, it was a little, you know, going around those hairpin curves on a single track road up through the mountains. Uh, on the one side, you got the mountain on the next side, way down, you know, you've got this sheer rock cliff uh, you know, steadily we're, we're climbing. Ten, ten years ago, when we first started coming here, you could hunt and import torrent ducks. Now you can't, not because of biology, not because they're endangered, but just because, because this country doesn't do biological surveys. They decided to not put it on their hunting calendar. Nonetheless, it's a very, very, very interesting duck. Uh, it makes its living in trout habitat in these fast-moving streams, and, and it's, only, it's only food competitor or trout. Uh, incredible, incredible species, and even though you can't hunt them or bring them back in the United States today, it's still uh, very interesting to stop and be able to see this unique waterfowl species. First thing you're going to notice, you know, not all ducks worldwide are mallards or pintails that are going to decoy and respond to decoys. These mountain species are like that. Um, they're very sparsely distributed across the terrain. Uh, this is not a classical duck hunt. We don't put decoys. You don't wear waders. Bring your binoculars and be ready to spot and stalk. It's as much a big game hunt as it is a waterfowl hunt. When you go up into the Andes Mountains to cherry pick these beautiful species, you are literally hunting for one or two representative of each species. Boy, I tell you what, we're here, we're here in uh, remote Peru at about 14,000 feet. Uh, very unusual hunting mountain species, but this is one of the cat daddy prizes here in Peru. It's called a puna teal. Uh, the species we're hunting up, up in the mountains are the Andean goose, the
the puna teal, the sharp wing teal, which is a subspecies of uh, speckled teal, and the uh, my favorite, the crested duck. You, you don't see any of these species below 10,000 feet, but once we crossed over that 10,000 foot threshold, we started seeing uh, loose flocks and individuals and cohort pairs of, uh, of Andean geese up in the alpine meadows. Two here, three there, five over there. What you're looking for is a nice adult breeding pair. Uh, and they need to be in a place because these alpine meadows are so wide open, they need to be in a place that the terrain lends itself to a stalk. We were filming and we heard the whistling, uh, whistling calls of a pair of Indian geese when we watched them land in this nearby alpine meadow. And as we blasted, it, there, there was a lot of rocky terrain that we could we could sneak up behind. And that's exactly what we did. It's a, it was a lot like a big game hunt in that respect. They were there, we wanted them. We were able to get within 40 yards and we orchestrated a, a, just a walk up using rocks as cover, peeked up over the top and pow pow collected our pair. The world's a whole lot bigger than our own backyards. Waterfowl species are very diverse in their, in their life habits, and you've got to be prepared to play their game, not your game. Uh, I find no shame in stalking and hunting these species up in the mountains, in the Andes Mountains. Uh, it, it's an it's a incredible, incredible experience. It was an incredible couple of days just uh, immersing ourselves into the local culture and, and around every curve, it was just something very different than what a waterfowl hunter normally encounters. You know, the interesting thing about chasing ducks is what you see beyond the duck. The last species in the mountains was a crested duck, and we found this beautiful drake asleep on the edge of a pond right behind uh, a mountain family home. We knocked on the door. Did they mind us going and hunting it? Of course not, they said. They, they even picked up their barking dog and brought him inside. We orchestrated a snake, pal, we got this beautiful crested duck, and as we're taking pictures afterwards, the family came out, it was a father and three daughters. They grow wool of, of uh, uh, alpaca and sheep wool, and, uh, and they invited us in to eat local food and drink hot coffee. Here we are in the Andes Mountains of Peru, having funnel cake with some new friends. Ooh, no doubt, this is awesome. Just took us into their home, like just like family. These very, very nice people. They let us hunt in a pond behind their house, and now they're making homemade funnel cakes for us. Sitting on an alpaca. Yeah. Alpaca blanket. This is as genuine and real as it gets. Thank you. We walk in this little, modest mountain home, and it, just, it, was, it was just so overwhelming to be treated to such hospitality. We were the first Americans to ever be in their home. They were proud to have us. And you know, even though we didn't speak the same exact language, there was, there was a language barrier, just the hand gestures and the smiles and the sharing of food and coffee was enough to, to supersede that language barrier. Crested duck, wow, what a unique species. It's uh, bronze secondaries and this little crest and it's just a marble plumage. And, it, and the interesting thing is it likes very, very shallow water. It, you'll find it just inches deep water dabbling to feed on invertebrates. 
What I find interesting about this bird is uh, he's very territorial. You never see him more than just a little family cohort or pair. Today we've seen singles and pairs. And uh, note, note also, I want to show you, I almost said it. Look at that, look at that bill. Does that remind you of a pintail? Look at that tail. Look at that long, long black sprig coming out on this duck. It's one of my favorite ducks. It's a very, very unique species, only at high altitudes. Only at high altitude are these birds gonna be again. Water runs downhill, so we ran downhill with it. And uh, we, we find ourselves, uh, we went from the mountains down into coastal Peru, right where the Pacific Ocean interfaces with the Atacama Desert. You've got this very thin sliver of fertile agricultural valley. Just imagine, you know, Pacific Ocean, valley, sand. And in that sliver, in that little valley of agriculture and lagoons, you've got the world's greatest density of cinnamon teal and white cheek pintails. And you might see occasionally a blue wing teal or yellow bill pintail, but the bag is predominantly always white cheek pintail and cinnamon teal. Everywhere else in the world I've hunted cinnamon teal and white cheek pintail, you see a few ones and twos and threes and fives. But here in Peru, you'll see dozens, flocks of dozens of, of cinnamon teal come roaring into the decoys, white cheek pintail coming over. It, it's just, it's really, uh, it's a sight to behold. And what a, what an amazing complimentary pair of ducks to hold in your hand, a cinnamon teal and a white cheek pintail that are so individually beautiful yet complement each other so perfectly. It is a little more traditional hunting for cinnamon teal because we do put out decoys, but it is a little pass shooting also. Uh, one of the most integral parts of the hunt are the bird boys that walk the miles long length of these wetlands beating a pop bottle like a drum and make them fly over. And uh, as the ducks fly over, they see the decoy and swoop over and give you, give you a shot. Uh, like I say, the world's a lot bigger than our own backyard. If, if, if you're expecting all of the species in the world to decoy like mallards on a great day, ah, you're gonna be disappointed. You know, what a, what a great way to end this adventure on the last morning, we step off into a wetland. There are tall cascading mountains to the east, to the west. In between it, there's just this shallow water. Uh, and it was just the whole, everything was kind of carpeted with this, this, this yellow succulent plant uh, on, the, on the shore banks. There were just gazillions of shorebirds uh, walking off in the shallow waters, flocks of flamingos flying epic flocks of white cheeked pintail. Uh, shot a few cinnamons, but it was just magnificent with the number of white cheeks that were coming in and decoy. It wasn't what I consider hiding in the conventional sense. I like to be just buried up in vegetation. Well, there's not a lot of, a lot of vegetation to hide in in some of these places. But what we ended up doing is I, I, I did have some cover around me. I sat still. I had the sun at my back. So as the, de as the birds were decoying, they had the sun in their eyes. They had to squint. And, uh, and it really made for some exciting shooting, just the way they were working over those decoys. These flocks were coming out of the west, getting low, balling up, coming over the decoys, and then, and then elevating. And it made the shooting pretty darn interesting. It, it, it was easy to knock down some uh, some doubles and triples and quadruples at times. Jake out here, out here, out here. See, every time I put my hands on white cheek pintail, I think to myself it may be one of the most beautiful waterfowl species on earth. It, it's uh, just the color, the color of a, of a copper penny root. Uh, 
the, the pintail beak with the, the, the blue and the, and, and the black stripe, it's got that red at the base. If you notice the bright white cheeks, you really see these, uh, that, that's a good focal point for decoying birds, is that bright white cheek when they're coming in. If you see these birds get up out in the wetlands, the, the, the tan, the gold, the copper, the copper on their, on their secondaries and their tail just really pops. I mean, like, there's no doubt what kind of bird that is. In hand, I just, I look at every part of this bird, it's just how beautifully put together it is. The secondaries uh, with, with, the, with the whites and the tans and the, and the green pop and the long tan sprig is just, it's an incredible, incredible bird. While we were here, we got introduced to the cultural practices of cockfighting and Spanish bullfighting. Those practices uh, stem from centuries. They're, they're centuries old traditions that I don't fully understand because it, it's just not my culture. But what I came to realize, especially as we posted some stuff in social media, especially as we met with our host, what I came to realize is that those traditions are as malaligned with some modern thought processes as duck hunting. You know, there are people that don't understand duck hunting. There are people that don't understand spot and stalk duck hunting. There are people that don't understand duck hunting at all that are very critical of my tradition in duck hunting. And all of a sudden, I'm sitting in their shoes because I'm now looking at a tradition that I don't fully understand. And it's very easy to be critical of it. In that way, it was, it was, uh, it gave me a lot to think about. It, it gave me a lot to think about where my tradition fits in the modern world on the same level as where those cultural traditions fit in today's way of thinking. It's been 10 years since I was in Peru, but I was here. I was finally here. And to cap it off with that hunt, stepping out was just, it's almost overwhelming. You know, a really great hunting adventure like Peru is so immersive and so fast paced and so changing. It, 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 it tends to just kind of overwhelm the senses. And walking out on that last morning with that heavy strap of white cheek pintails, you know, it just, it really hit home. I was here, I was, I was finally back here to Peru. I, I, I was right back in, in where I belong, you know, on the road, looking at this kind of stuff. And, and just to walk out with, with a strap full of such beautiful species, having seen and become immersed in such an amazing culture, um, that, that's the reward. That, that's the reward. It's not just the birds. It's what those birds represent in, term, in terms of an introduction to all this varied culture around the world. Oh,